Hello from the National Archives. My name is Missy McNatt and I'm an education specialist in Washington, DC. And welcome to the National Archives Comes Alive Young Learners Program. You can find information about future programs on the National Archives website under events and on the National Archives Facebook page. This morning, we will meet Harriet Tubman, called Moses, but also a scout, a nurse, and a spy with the Union Army during the Civil War, and after the war, an activist for women's rights and a humanitarian throughout her life. Harriet Tubman is portrayed by Dr. Daisy Century, talented teacher and inspirational actor with the American Historical Theater. February is Black History Month, and it is a time for us to acknowledge and reflect on the African-American experience in America, both the trials and tribu tribulations and the inspirational deeds and people. And surely Harriet Tubman is an inspiration to us today. In the holdings of the National Archives, we have numerous records related to Harriet Tubman, including this one, a photograph of Harriet Tubman from the um, 1870s. And this document and many, many others can be found in docsteach.org. Uh, and the next slide is a uh, the featured activity for this program. Um, and we encourage you to check it out at the end of our program. And again, we will share this information um, at the end. After Harriet Tubman's presentation, we will have a question and answer session. So please write your questions in the YouTube chat box. We have a National Archives uh, staff member who is monitoring it. And let us know where you're watching from today. This program is brought to you by the National Archives Education staff, the National Archives, and the National Archives Foundation. And we hope you enjoy the, this program. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Harriet Tubman, a determined woman who changed the lives of individuals and the nation. That Harriet Tubman wasn't scared of nothing. She wasn't scared of nobody neither. She didn't come in this world to be no slave, and she didn't stay one neither. Early one morning, she stole away. She ran and ran and ran through the rivers, through the forest, hound dogs on her trail, but she ran and ran until she got to freedom. But she didn't stop there. She went back time and time again making well over 13 trips and bringing well over 500 with her to Freedom Land. $40,000 on her head, dead or alive. But that old Harriet Tubman was too clever. She never did take the same route twice. She would go around in circles. She said, that's what I do. That Harriet Tubman, I tell you, was braver than brave. Ice water running through her veins. She was known to the Union soldiers as General Tubman. She was known to the abolitionists as the prophet. She was known to the slaves as Moses. Now I figure, I figure in this life I'm owed two things, either death or freedom. If I can't have one, I'll have the other. Now go way back. Go way back in your mind, way back to the 1800s, 1820s, Maryland Eastern Shores. Oh, life was beautiful. Big house on the hill, animals grazing, white picket fence, flowers. Maryland Eastern Shores in the 1820s was beautiful, but not for the slaves. My daddy say, my daddy say, I'm five years old. That's what my daddy say. He know because he already plant the corn five times since I've been born. So that make me five. And when you plant the corn some more, I'm going to be old again. I don't know how old, but I'm going to be old again. My daddy knows. My daddy knows everything. But there was something about me. I noticed everything around me. I noticed that when the leaves come on the tree, 
pretty soon it will be warm. And I noticed that when the leaves fall off the tree, pretty soon it will be cold. And my daddy would lick his thumb and say, ah, that's a west wind that's blowing. I wonder how my daddy know that. And I noticed that all the older slaves would sit on the south side of the cabin because it's warmer there. So I noticed everything around me. And the master of the plantation noticed it too. He said, that little one right there, that little one right there, I got to keep my eye on that little one right there. Always got a face all frowned up. When I tell her to look at me, she won't look at me, so that little one going to be a troublemaker right there. So master would send me off to work to the next plantation. My first job was to take messages from one place to another. Master would write something on the paper, give it to me, and I would run to the next person, give it to them, they would write something on it, and I would go back and forth all day long in that hot sun. That was my first job. My next job was to mind the little baby. I don't know nothing about minding no little babies. And Mrs. says, every time that baby cry, you're going to get beat. And I try to rock that baby to sleep. I try to keep that baby quiet. But that little baby cried day and night, and I got beat day and night because I couldn't keep that little baby quiet. So I would go by the fireplace and lay down on the floor, try to sleep the best I could. So the only salvation I had, the only salvation I had was being with my daddy. My daddy was what they call a woodsman. He would take his wagon and saw and go out in the wood and cut logs and I would help him put the small branches in the wagon. When I was out in the woods with daddy, daddy would show me everything. He would say, Minty, see that jackrabbit right there? It's got a thick fur. That means it's gonna be a cold winter. And you see that little bush over there? With the white blossom, oh, that's powerful, Minty. Put some of that in your mouth, put you off into a deep sleep. You got that, Minty? I said, yes, sir, Daddy. Because I followed right behind my Daddy. And he said, let's see now, there's one more around here. Oh, this little one over here with the red beads at the top. That's good for any kind of itch you might have. Or any kind of swelling, you rub some of that on, the itch stop, the swelling just disappear in no time. And... That one right there with the three leaves up going from the top, that one's good for any kind of fever you might have. Drink some of that, feel better in no time. You got that, Minty? I said, yes, sir, Daddy. He said, now, I'm gonna teach you how to walk through the woods so quiet, not even the birds would flutter. You walk right behind me now, you hear? I said, yes, sir. So Daddy would put his toe down and curl it around, put his toe down and curl it around, and I followed right behind him. Pretty soon I got so good at it, I could sneak up on anybody. And I would just touch them and they would say, oh, what you scare me? Oh, I got good at sneaking up on people because I was real quiet. Oh, I just liked being out in the woods with my daddy. And my daddy teaching me everything. So we would go back in the house and my dad would wait until it got real dark and says, everybody, come on out, come on out. I got something to show you. All right, where is it, where is it? Ah, oh, where is it? Gotta be somewhere around here, where is it? Ah, oh, let me see, I'm facing the north. Gotta be this way, to the right. Mm, let's see, let's see. There it is, Minty, the North Star. You follow that star, Minty, you're going north, you hear? See how it looks? Looks just like our gourd dipper, we use to dip water out of the well, Minty. See how it looks, Minty? It's got the handle and the dipper. You get that in your head. You get that pitch in your head, Minty, you hear? <clears throat> handle, dipper. You follow that star, Minty, you're going north. Now, if it's too cloudy out and it's raining and you can't find that star, you feel the tree for the moss. Moss only grows on the north side of the tree. You remember that now, you hear? I said, yes, sir, Daddy. Little did I know what my dad was teaching me, I could use later on in my life. I started making preparation. He says, no, they're not going to sell me. I said, no. I started packing everything I could, 
some of the herbs my daddy told me about, some meat skins, some whole cakes, some water. I got three brothers. I told them, I says, I'm getting ready to run off. Y'all going with me? They said, yeah, meant to be going. I said, well, meet me in three days' time down by the pond, that big old tree. You know the place. Meet me there. We'll be there, Minty. She says, okay, don't be late. Three days time come. I'm down by the river, waiting for my brothers. Hear footsteps. I says, come on. Y'all ready? Come on. I said, Minty, we ain't going again. We're too scared. I said, don't you think I'm scared too? I'm scared. I don't know if I'm gonna go the right way. I don't know if I can find the star. I'm gonna be all alone at night in the swamp. And I know what's gonna happen if they catch me. They said, Minty, please don't go, Minty. Please, they're gonna hurt you bad, Minty. I said, I got to go. I got to go. Just one minute. Being a free woman on, on, free, on free dirt is enough for my soul. Just being free for one minute. Got to go. I went in the cabin to tell mom and daddy bye. Daddy turned his back. Daddy said, I'm not going to look at you, little girl. Because when they asked, did I see you run off? I can say I actually didn't see you run off, so I'm not going to look at you. I know this day was coming since you've been a little old girl. That's why I teach you everything I know. You remember about the star, Minty? I said, yes, sir. You remember how to walk through the woods quiet? Yes, sir. Where you going, Minty? You going to freedom in here. Run as fast as you can, Minty. You going to freedom. I said, thank you, Daddy. Thank you. Mama said, Minty, all I got to give you, Minty, is this old quilt. All I got to give is this old quilt to keep you warm at night. But you're going, Minty. You're going to freedom. Don't worry with me and Daddy. We'd be just fine. You're going now, you hear? Says, Thank you, Mama. Thank you. Thank you. Again. I ran and I ran two weeks, two weeks and a half, three weeks. Now, in the fields, they said, when you get ready to run off, after about three, three and a half weeks, you're going to find a little little cottage down in the valley belonging to a Quaker woman. She will tell you all about the safe houses on the Underground Railroad. Oh, and I've been seeing how many times the, the sun crossed the sky. It seems like about three weeks. There was a little house. I says, oh Lord, please let this be the house. But I watched that house for about an hour, make sure nobody coming in or out. I went up and knocked at the door. I was about to walk away and the voice says, who is it? It's me, Minty, down from the Broder's place, down in Maryland. You by yourself? Yes. Quick as a flash, the door open. A safe house on the Underground Railroad. They gave me food and water, dried clothes and shoes because I was running through the streams and rivers. I stayed there for two days to rest up. I said, now, from here on in, this is how you can tell if it's a safe house or not. You look for a broom. If you see a broom by the door, that means it's a safe house. And not only is it a safe house, but if they're right on your trail, you run up to that porch, you get that broom, and you start sweeping, like you've been living there all along. You got that? I said, I got that. Now, I can't read nor write, but you give me a paper. She gave me a paper with Pennsylvania on it. She said, when you get to the fork in the road, there's going to be a sign. You match the letters up. If it looks just like what's on your paper, you made it to Pennsylvania. You got that? I said, I got that. I said, all right, Harriet. God speed with you. You keep on following the rivers like you've been doing. That'll take you down through Dover, Odessa, into Wilmington, Chester, Philadelphia, through the marsh. You got it? I said, yes, I got it. 
Farewell, Harriet. Oh, I took off. I ran and I ran as fast as I could. I ran and I ran. Going on five weeks. Oh, the end of five weeks, there it was. The fork in the road and there was a sign. Oh. 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 It looks just like what's on my paper. <laughs> I made it. I made it. Oh. And mom and daddy could see me. Now my brothers could see me. I made it. <laughs> on this side of the line, I was a slave woman. On this side of the line, I was a free woman. <sighs> oh, I can't look the same. Now that I'm free, I can't look the same. <laughs> oh, but when I crossed that line, it was like gold came over everything. I looked up at the sun and the sun was like gold. It made my skin and clothes, the leaves and the grass, the trees, everything was golden. And there was a hush. This is how freedom feels. Freedom is quiet and golden. <laughs> I was free, but I was all alone in freedom land. I looked around, I didn't see anybody. I thought there would be a, a big group of people to, to drag me across the freedom line. I, I thought there would be singing and shouting and waving flags and food, but there was nobody to greet me in freedom land. I got to Philadelphia, they gave me a place to stay and food and clothes and I took and washed to make a few pennies here and there. Oh, freedom was nice. I look all around. I, See colored people, fancy clothes on, walking around, nobody tied up, nobody getting beat. Oh, freedom was nice. And then I sat down with a, a colored man, his name was William Still. He said, Miss Harriet, tell me everything. He could read and write. Did my heart good. And I'd tell him everything and he would write it down. How many people come up with me? And did I come by myself? Which way did I come? He would write everything down. Oh, freedom was nice. But after about a month, they said, Harriet, no. You got that look in your eye, Harriet, no, 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 Harriet. You're not even thinking about going back. Please don't go back, Harriet. There's a reward for you, dead or alive, Harriet. They're looking for you real bad, Harriet. You can go into New Jersey, into New York, into Canada, where you'll truly be free. Please don't go back, Harriet, please. I said, I got to go back. I promised my brothers I'll come back for them. And my mom and daddy back there, and a lot of other people who want to be free. I know the way. I know the way. I can bring them to freedom land. I said, Harriet, no. I said, I got to go back. I can't stay up here and pretend to enjoy freedom there back there. I ain't free till they're free. I got to go back. And I went back time and time again. Anybody who wanted to come to Freedom Land, man, woman, boy, girl, baby, didn't matter. I would give the signal where to meet me, and they would come. I says, you can come to Freedom with me with one rule. There'll be no turning back. No one's going to be turning back. I said, all right, the person in the front got to carry the stick. The person in the front carry the stick. So they got to go back and forth, back and forth, because sometimes the slave catchers plant big old kind of uh, traps in the woods, bear traps that can snap off your ankle just like that. And sometimes they dig big pits filled with stakes and spikes. If you fall in one of that, that's to be the end of you. So that person in the front will have to find the holes or any kind of trap. The person in the back will have some kind of bush tied to them. And as we walk, that bush will erase some of the tracks. So it's all right, you're ready to go. All right, let's go. But we're going through the mud. I said, wait. I give the signal. I said, it's too quiet. The leaves on the tree are not moving. I don't hear a cricket. I don't hear a frog. 
says, go back, go back. And sure enough, after I go all the way around and check, slave catchers waiting for us in the clearing of the swamp. So the whole time, I could hear my daddy's voice says, listen to the forest, Minty, listen to the forest. We made our way out. That's what I did on all my journeys till I got everybody out. Got my mom and daddy, got my brothers and sisters, and hundreds of other folks who wanted to be free. Because you see, that Harriet Tubman wasn't born to be no slave, and she didn't stay one neither. No, sir, she didn't stay one neither. Harriet Tubman, Miss Tubman, that was a wonderful, wonderful performance. And wow, dangerous, so dangerous. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll clap here, fantastic. Um, and we now have our question and answer session, but let me start by saying we have folks from across the United States with us today, from Oregon, Alaska, New Orleans, Colorado, all the way uh, St. Augustine, Florida. A special hello to all the students and teachers at the Culverton School, uh, you know, St. Mary's, uh, North Carolina, goodness gracious, I know I'm not going to get them all, Denmark, Indiana, and somebody from Auburn, New York, where... Harriet Tubman is buried. So uh, my apologies if I missed your where you are from, but wow, I am so excited that uh, we have so many folks here. Rhode Island, um, yeah, fantastic. So uh, we've got some questions for you. And um, uh, first question, uh, so why did you continue to return south to rescue uh, slaves? Well, first of all, there's compassion in my heart. And I knew how hard it was for me as a child. And I didn't want anybody else to go through that. And the good Lord provided a way for me to run off to freedom, to find a way to get there. So now that I know the way, I could go back and get others. And I knew it was dangerous, but I trust the good Lord and the I know he would provide for me. So that's why I continue going to get people because I didn't want them to go through what I went through as a child. So what would you say was your most dangerous moment on one of the missions? Oh, it's hard to say. Every time I went on a mission, it was just as dangerous as the other one, sometimes more dangerous. But I was very careful not to be seen, not to be heard, like my daddy said, to walk real quiet, to sneak up on people. So the most dangerous one, of course, was one time I was on the train. Slate catches patrolling the train, slate catches outside. Now, how am I going to get off? But back then, you could travel with your chickens and hogs in little containers. So there was a woman that had some chickens in a little container. And I said, let me hold your chickens. And I let the chickens go. And I run behind the chicken. I said, oh, my chicken, my chicken, my chicken. So I run right past the slave catchers, playing in my arms, my chickens, my chickens. So that was perhaps the closest they ever come to being sought after or being caught. Wow. that's uh, That sounds like you are always, always thinking and just coming up with plans just very, very quickly. That's pretty amazing. Um, how many people did you take to freedom? Well, <clears throat> the people with me, and sometimes I lost track myself, it was well over 300. Wow. Well over 300, yes. That's that's quite a few. And um, well, you, you kind of talked about this, but your siblings, how many siblings do you have? Well, <clears throat> we're nine all together. I made number nine. I had four brothers and four sisters. And, and you got them all out to freedom? Got them all out to freedom, except my older sister. She died shortly before I got a chance to rescue her. And I always think about that. Oh, so uh, a question about what you would put on the, the ba somebody didn't quite hear what you said, what you put on the baby's gums to keep them quiet. Well, early in my life, 
My dad would take me out into the woods and show me everything. And he showed me a little plant that had white blossom. And that was, he says, he takes some of that and puts you out into a deep sleep. So that's what I wrote on the baby's gum, that plant. It puts you out into a deep sleep. Uh. Now, today's time, we out in the future, will be something like the poppy plant. We are in the future. We just call it the green plant with the white blossom. Uh, so here's another question. What was it like traveling through thick and thin or, you know, all the different places that you traveled? Uh, so I guess the marshes, the rivers and, and all the and, and I, I, kind of going along with that. How long would it take you to make take a group to freedom? Well, Nancy. It used to take us about six weeks or so or maybe before. But sometimes we have to stay in one place for sometimes three, four days because slave patrol is all over the place. So we have to look into that and account of the weather. So we have to take all of that into account. But usually for the most part, all the way from Maryland into Philadelphia, into New York, into Canada, that take at least about six, seven weeks maybe at the most. Now that's a that's a long time. And did here's a question: Did you um, always? I mean, you had to trust people, and was that ever an issue for you? Um, everybody who worked with you, did you ever think somebody was going to turn against you or anything like that? Oh, all the time, all the time. I had to watch myself, and I learned that from my daddy. Never exposed too much. Sometimes people would ask me, this time when are we leaving? I said, we're leaving first thing in the morning when I know we're going to be leaving in two days. And then I would go to the place where I said, meet me, and I would see the slave cat is there with that person. So a lot of times I would give them false information. When I knock on the door, I would say false information, a false name. So I would always think of through things, always think in my head what's going to happen. But I never give out my information to nobody. You want to go to freedom? You do as I say. You don't ask questions. Wow. Um, and then question. Um, why did you change your name to Harriet Tubman from Minty? Well, when I was a little girl, they used to call me Araminta. That's a big old name, Araminta. Sometimes they call me Minty. I just didn't like that name, Araminta. So I liked my mama's name better. My mama's name was Harriet. So I changed my name to Harriet. And of course, I got married to a free man by the name of John Tubman. So I got the Tubman for the last name. So Harriet Tubman became my name for the rest of my life. And, and how old were you when you made it to freedom? When you well, were... The first time I took off been somewhere around 28, 29 years old. Wow. And um, how did you get food on your trips, on your journeys? Oh, what? Get food. Food. Well, most of the times I took meat skins and I took um, some of the, um, the roots that we had roasted with me. I would roast that ahead of time. I knew the berries to get. I looked for the roots as we come through. We take that. When we get to a safe house, they would give us food. So that would last us until we could get to the next safe house. Okay. Uh, and and where did you stay in Philadelphia when you oh, first escaped to Philadelphia? There was there somewhere on 13th Street. I can't remember the name of the street, but I remember they said 13th Street. Mr. Williams still lived there, and he had a house, two houses down the block. So somewhere on 13th Street, off of uh, Spruce, I think it was, if I remember correctly. I think it was 13th and Spruce, right in that area. Okay. And when, because you mentioned taking people to Canada, when did you start taking people to Canada? And not just to uh, across the line to fill it to, to Pennsylvania. Well, see, now we always went to Canada. We didn't stay in Philadelphia for too long. But the ah. news would get around. That fugitive slave 
Aunt Laura had. The slave catchers could come to Philadelphia, take any black people, free or not, pick them up right off the street and take them back and sell them into slavery. So it wasn't too safe right off. We stayed there for a little while. We go into New Jersey, stayed there for a little while, into New York and into Canada. So my trip was going to Canada all the time. The most I would go to St. Catherine in Canada. That was like my headquarters. I would stay there and think out in my head, what's my next trip? Where I was going to go? How many people I was going to pick up on each one of the trips? And some of the cold words we would have, we would have a word, my connection with each one of the safe houses. So that's where I would go. Now, figure that out in about a month or so, two months, I'll be ready again for my journey. Check my bag, be ready to go. So I have a question. This is actually from me because you talked about uh, the fact that you were able to connect, figure out you were in Pennsylvania because you had a piece of paper with writing on it and you were to match it. Did you ever, I mean, and you were such a planner, did you ever learn to read and write? No. In all the times, I never did learn to read and write. I could look at some of the letters and I know what the letter looked like, but I couldn't quite cipher out what it was. And here's an interesting one on any of your escape journeys with taking people to freedom. Did you ever have help um, a mother give birth to a child? No, because at the beginning of our trip, if I know she's expecting, I know, of course, I would rule against it. I would wait. If she's too close to birth, I would wait until she had that little baby. But Taking a woman along, you never know what would happen. So that was one of the things I didn't do. If she was expecting or getting very close, I would wait. If she had the baby, then she would come along with us. All right. I think that's uh, all of our questions for this morning. So thank you so much. Wow. I mean, just as I said, you are such an <laughs> amazing, amazing, amazing person. So thank you for joining us today and uh, ex talking about your story and just an inspiration to all of us. So thank you and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. And please do check out the activity on Docs Teach connected to our program today about Harriet Tubman. It's Docs Teach, D O C S T E A C H dot org. And you can search for it under documents or activities. And finally, please join us in March for our program on Alice Paul. And uh, the information for that, again, can be found on the National Archives website under events and also on the National Archives Facebook page. Look forward to seeing you in March for the Alice Paul program uh, for Women's History Month. Thank you and have a good afternoon.